So uh, I'm going to talk to you about Cash Heal Life, and again, the usual disclaimer applies. Um, it's uh, my personal views, they've got nothing to do with the university or the hospital. Uh, as I tell everyone, there's plenty of uh, politicians in the public sector. Uh, for some reason, they seem to be concentrated in uh, NUS, NTU, and SGH. I don't know why. So, this is actually a slide that was uh, shown to me by Lawrence Lien from the Lien Center. And this basically describes the four main trajectories that are going to happen to every single one of us. Can we switch off the light? Yeah, now we can turn off the light, sorry. So this is the, the sudden heart attack. Okay, you're doing fine, and then suddenly one day you get a heart attack and you drop dead. That's the end of the story. That's my favorite. Okay, if I get a choice, that's the way I want to go. Me too. Yeah. Okay, unfortunately, this only falls to a small number of people who get the, the, the heart attack. Okay. A lot of us, and this is what we're worried about, see, we get the cancer. So this is a terminal illness. Then over a period of a few months, uh, you, you, you have a lot of pain and suffering, and then eventually you pass away. So this takes months. Uh, this is the organ failure one, where you have, say, kidney failure, you have diabetes, you lose your vision, you lose a leg, you get a stroke. So you have dips. You go down, you go up, you go down, you go up, you go down, you go up. But every time you go up, it's a lower up than the previous, uh, previous high. Then eventually, over a period of years, you go down like this. And then you've got this category, which is frailty. So you don't really have any major disease, you don't have diabetes, you don't have cancer, you don't have heart disease, but just over the 90 to, to you know, 80, 90, you slowly start dwindling. Uh, and a lot of people also are, are in that category. Yeah, I think it's too big, so you missed yeah. out the top of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> okay, never mind. So, so basically, what uh, Care Shield is doing is dealing with this group, this group, uh, and not really with this group, because if you have cancer, you're going to be dead within three to six months, or, or six months to one year, and, and you don't generally get disabled. You are well enough, you go for chemotherapy, you come back, you know. Uh, so here, these are the two categories that it's sort of dealing with, uh, and these are the ones that we, we are worried about. And, and again, as all of you have said, I could hear from the buzz that um, every one of us has had some opportunity to look after somebody with, in this category or this category who has got a chronic illness or who is just slowly deteriorating over time. So I think the first good thing about Cash Heal Life is that they have recognized the problem, okay, that there is a problem, that there is this, this situation that there's a significant number of people who need uh, long-term care and it's very expensive. Okay, it costs at least a thousand, two thousand dollars, okay, uh, a month. And we're not even talking about the cost of adult diapers. I know people go to JV to buy adult diapers because it's cheaper over there, because it's just ridiculously expensive if you buy them here. Now, my big problem with Cash Shield Life is that it is regressive. Okay? It is regressive in that it's like a flat tax. You know, conservatives in the United States, they love a flat tax. They say it's fair. Everybody pays the same. You're Bill Gates, you pay $100. You are uh, 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 the homeless guy in the street, you pay $100. I think that's wrong. Okay? And most progressives here, and I think most people in this room would think that it's wrong. Okay? But that is unfortunately the state of uh, Cash Shield and Medi Shield Life is that there's a flat fee and there's a subsidy. So the subsidy is means tested and it's based on your per capita household income. So if you are Ng Teng Fong or, or you know, the late Ng Teng Fong's family, you're still paying the same amount as, as each one of us, you see, who, who has a per capita income above $2,600. Uh, $2, now $2,600 is not a lot of money in Singapore, okay? Uh, effectively, most middle-class Singaporeans are, are, are above the 2,600. So you are paying the same amount uh, as, as uh, Robert Ng and Philip Ng and, and uh, you know all the other uh, super billionaires in Singapore. And, and, and to me, uh, I think there's a bit of a concern about that. And, and the reason why there's a concern about that is because even though um, illness can strike anybody, but certain illnesses tend to strike. Uh, um, disproportionately those who are lower income or lower socioeconomic status. And, and we have evidence for that from Singapore's own registration of births and deaths. Now this is a document that most people don't read. <laughs> it's got uh, hundreds of tables and things like that. But it's got a lot of very interesting information. And one of the most interesting pieces of information is this issue of the average age of death. Now everybody tells you the life expectancy in Singapore is 83 years. Do you know what that means? That means a baby born in Singapore 
but at 2018, can expect to live to 83 years. It does not mean that every one of us here in this room is going to live to 83, unfortunately. Okay? What it is, is the average age of death in Singapore today, and this is based on the latest figures from the Registry of Births and Death, is actually 77 for Chinese, 70 for Malays, and 68.7 for Indians. That's a huge gap. Okay, there's a seven year difference, seven year difference between Chinese and Malays and an eight to nine year difference between Chinese and Indians. And, uh, and this gap is not just in, you know, diseases related to eating too much nasi biryani. Okay, <laughs> but it also includes diseases like colon cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer. There's a gap at every level. In, and according to this is official statistics. So why is this so? And the answer is that in, in this data, as far as I can understand it, uh, ethnicity is a proxy for income. Because the incomes are distributed differently in Singapore. And, you, and income has been shown to be associated with uh, low states of health in Singapore. There's a wealth of data on this. There's groups of students from the university who go to the Taman Jurong area and they ask people, why don't you go for getting your high blood pressure treated? The number one reason they say too expensive, no time. I'm working two jobs. I work shift jobs. I cannot go to uh, see the doctor regularly. Uh, they ask them why don't they go for screening? Okay, cancer. If you detect it early, you can cure it. If you detect it late, it's too late. See, nothing you can do about it. That's why you end up dying early. And, and the reason again is because of low income. They compared the rental flats with the uh, owner-occupied flats, and they found that those in the rental flats had much lower rates of screening for colorectal cancer. They didn't go for their colonoscopy because it cost $1,000 or more, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, those of us here take for granted. But if you're living in a rental flat, you know, to be able to do that is not so easy. So they don't go for colonoscopy, they don't go for breast mammograms, for cervical cancer screening. And, and the result is that you end up people dying younger because you, you die unnecessarily from a disease which is potentially preventable. So basically what happens is that you the lower income Singaporeans who are paying the same amount as a billionaire ends up subsidizing the billionaire. Because if you're not going to live to this level in which you're going to use the benefits of casual life, you end up paying for somebody who is going to, to, to do that. And it doesn't make sense, right? I mean, why would we need to subsidize the billionaire? See, the billionaire doesn't need, billionaires mostly buy their own insurance or they insure themselves or they have enough money so they don't really care about, you know, to them $600 a month is, not, is nothing. See? I mean, that's the kind of money they spend on a bottle of wine. You know? But to, to, to have a scheme like that, which is so regressive, um, I think is a, is a, is a serious problem. Um, and, and back to this point, uh, the studies of what uh, Mr. Tan was talking about, foot infections, people in Singapore every year, there are about 500 to 700 amputations. And these were shown to be uh, related to income. And it's not just uh, ethnicity, because this is the Singapore Malay Eye Study, where they compared low-income Malays with high-income Malays. And you see that uh, low-income Malays have much worse uh, state of health compared to high-income Malays. And it's not just uh, uh, income, but language is another uh, way of looking at uh, um, income distribution. So this was a study at patients with diabetes and eye, and they saw that Tamil-speaking Indians versus uh, English-speaking Indians Big difference in terms of outcome. And again, you know, healthcare is a matter of talking to the, the doctor. A lot of it is understanding what's wrong with you, getting the communication right. And so this issue of inequality is a huge issue. It has come to the fore uh, many places across the world. And, and the danger of uh, a regressive form of payment of, of cash in life is that it's going to exacerbate inequality. So, so that is the first point which I have. I think it's good that we are introducing something to deal with long-term care, but I think it needs to be reorganized and improved so that it doesn't exacerbate the inequality. Now, you know, Singapore uh, has gone into this uh, commercialized healthcare, restructured hospitals, privatization in the last 20 or, 20 or so years, but it wasn't always like this. Okay, Singapore's best health minister, in my opinion, was the health minister in 1960, Mr. Ahmad Ibrahim. Okay? And in 1960, the World Health Organization sent a delegation to Singapore and Malaysia to study the healthcare system, to try and understand why the health in Singapore and Malaysia was so good. And, and Mr. Awan Ibrahim gave a speech to, to this WHO group, and he pointed out that Singapore had dealt with most of the major infectious diseases. They had gone away. 
and the Director of Medical Services pointed out that in 1960, the medical services here are predominantly, though not entirely, a responsibility of the government, with the mass of the population entitled to medical care without personal cost. Medical personnel are salaried employees of the government, most of the hospital facilities are governmental, all these are financed from general revenues. Private practice persists for a small upper income segment of the population, especially in the city area. So this is what it was like in Singapore in 1960, before I was born. Okay. But it continued for quite a while. The idea that healthcare is something that is a government responsibility. And, and governments get their money from taxes. And in those days when they had a state duty, when they had capital gains tax, when dividends were taxed, the wealthy paid more. And, and that didn't hinder the, the economic development of Singapore. 1960s and 1970s was the boom time for, for Singapore's economy. And it didn't just stay in the 1960s, it continued all the way up to 1980, in the mid-1980s. And in 1983, the government produced a blue paper. Okay, not white paper or green paper, but in those days it was a, there was a blue paper on, on healthcare. And at that time, in 1983, when Singapore's healthcare was entirely used to go to a polyclinic, some of you may remember the maternal and child health clinics everywhere, that it wasn't a polyclinic, you know, it was a small little uh, clinic in the corner somewhere. Uh, and the most you paid was $5, you know. Uh, you could go to the general hospital, you pay a dollar a day, you know, and that was the standard uh, uh, rate. And, and the result of that was Singapore had an infant mortality rate that was lower than the UK and US. Okay, so don't believe it when people tell you quality will drop when you provide free care. Because when we provided free care from 1960 to 1980, 1985, the handle of healthcare in Singapore was very good. Okay, and there are many reasons for that. Singapore is small and compact. We have an educated population. We have a good, uh, uh, we have an excellent medical school of which I'm a part of, uh, and we have a very good nursing school. So, so a lot of that was contributing and. and uh, if you want to talk about maintaining standards, you do not have to charge the earth. That's the point. See, you can charge a dollar, five dollars, and the evidence is there from Singapore in the 1970s uh, and 80s. See, that you get really world class standards of healthcare for a dollar, five dollars a, a visit. Now, moving on. So, that's healthcare. Then there's the issue of uh, disability. So, the question is asked is how many disabled people are there in Singapore? And this question was actually asked by Dennis Tan in Parliament. And the Ministry of Social and Family Affairs gave him an answer, and it's quite interesting. They used the school-based population, and they said 2% of school children in Singapore are disabled. Now, there are a lot of school uh, children who are not in school because of disabilities. These are children with very severe disabilities. My mom has spent 20 years trying to make education compulsory for these children, and it is coming. It hasn't come yet. Singapore still does not have compulsory education for disabled children. So you estimate that the figure is about 3%. 3% is a lot. You know, if we're talking about uh, 30,000, 40,000 children uh, a year at, at every level, so 3% so of that is about 900 to 1,000 uh, uh, children who are disabled. Okay, this is children at school going age. From the 18 to 49 group, it's 2.4%. Uh, it's and for those 50 years and above, it's 13%. So this is any disability. So 13%. <coughs> It is a lot, but it's not a huge number. Okay, you play the odds, right? So this 13%, this is any disability. So this is like the blind man who uh, Kinnan was talking about, or, or somebody who has got uh, a, a mild stroke who has recovered from that. So the severely disabled is actually a much smaller proportion of this, this cohort. See? And, and that's why I don't understand where they got the figure that one in two people are at risk of a severe disability. But having said that, Including these children with disabilities in cashier life, I think, is a good thing. Because these children have pre-existing illnesses and they're excluded from all the other private insurances that exist. So, if, so in fact, the statement in the cashier life uh, um, website is once you have made your first payment at the age of 30, then you can start claiming for the rest of your life. And this is good. So imagine if you had a child with a severe disability, and you looked after the child well, the child is now 30, 30 years old, all you have to do is make your first payment in January of the year that the, the child turns 30, and then after that you get paid for the rest of your life. And this is a, 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 a positive thing, because a lot of these children, their parents are growing old. Can you imagine if the child is 30, the parents are like 50-something, and they're worried, what happens if the parent dies, or if the parent gets sick, who's going to look after this child? 
Uh, in fact, an illustration of this is, is my friend David Lang, who's a lecturer at the Singapore Bible College. He was in the newspapers recently. He's got three children with severe disabilities. One of them has just passed away. Uh, the older one, who's still alive, has just celebrated her 27th birthday. Uh, and he has two full-time uh, uh, domestic helpers, plus his wife, who's quit a lot for the job full-time, just to look after these, these, these two young children. And it's a genetic disease, so nothing to do with their lifestyle or anything like that. But uh, it's really, really costly. He says it costs them 7000 to $8,000 a month just to look after these two kids with disabilities. So once uh, the older kid turns 30, she'll hopefully be pay make one payment in cash your life, and then she'll be entitled to the $600 a month for the rest of her life. So again, this has been uh, uh, identified by the Lian Center, where they point out that uh, uh, most of the people with disabilities in Singapore have a, have a low income. It's a very good report. It's worth uh, looking at. The one concern about that is that Kev Chill Life has to be a supplement. It cannot be a replacement. Uh, and I'm a little bit anxious about that because some of you know Jose Raymond. He used to be Vivian Balakrishnan's uh, press secretary, the campaign manager. He, he, uh, he's now with the Singapore People's Party. He told me some interesting stories of the 2015 general election, how uh, he organized various things for the other side. But uh, he wrote this story on his Facebook about a, a, a gentleman who was uh, uh, trying to get Comcare assistance but they counted his CPF uh, savings as income and the fact that he had a friend who gave him money every now and again. So therefore, he fell below the means test threshold and he couldn't get um, uh, support from Comcare. So the fear is that if they include the $600 a month that you get from your care shield, they must not take away all the other benefits that you get. If they do take it away, then there's no point in getting it. See? Then what happens is you've shifted the burden from the government, which gets its money from corporations and gambling taxes and whatnot, to the individual. Okay? And, and that's the regressive nature of this cash shield. So if cash shield is a supplement, I think it's a good thing. If cash shield is a replacement, I think it'll be a disaster. So I think this hasn't been made clear. And, and I think there's been some reaction to Jose's uh, uh, post. Uh, in fact, MSF replied to him, so hopefully there'll be something. Now the other issue is if you read the fine print, you know, Elder Shield was three hundred dollars, then it became four hundred dollars, and then it was stuck at that. Care Shield, they have told us, will go up every year. Okay, they have already told us ahead of time it's going to go up. The premium is going to go up every year, and, and they have raised the uh, the issue here. The statement is that if they the even in their own FAQ, they ask the question, can it go down? Uh, and they didn't answer that question. <laughs> but as you know, in Singapore, a lot of things can only go up and never go down. But in actual fact, the number of disabled people in developed countries has been going down every year. In the United States, the number of people with dementia has gone down by 25% in the last 10 years. In Japan, okay, this is uh, those over the age of 85, those over the age of 75, over the age of 65, and, and the rate of disability has gone down. And this makes sense, because as you are at better medical care, you are less likely to be disabled. See, if you have better medical care, you're less likely to get a stroke in the first place. We've got better drugs, we've got better control of high blood pressure. You get a stroke now, within six hours you go to hospital, they try and dissolve the clot so that you don't get a disability. And even if you do get a disability, you get all these high-tech uh, aids to help you so that you don't have to be, be disabled in itself. Uh, there is uh, very high quality geriatric research in Singapore. I mean, if you Google geriatric research Singapore, you see there's at least four different institutes which are doing research in geriatrics. So again, maybe I'm biased. I'm an academic who does research in medicine. I cannot believe that, that, you know, that the number of disabled people in Singapore is going to rise. The absolute number of disabled people in Japan has gone up a little, but the proportion has gone down significantly. So what that means is people, instead of being disabled, they're actually spending money, they are earning money. See? So, and the Lien Center has done a study in older people in Singapore. What do older people in other parts of the world do? You know, they don't collect cardboard, except in Singapore. They go on cruises, they spend money, they look after their grandchildren, they play mahjong, they hang around in coffee shops. You know, and these are people who are contributing to the economy. So, so the older person in, in a developed society where you have access to care is not a burden, but it's actually fueling the economy. And so the, the uh, actuarial data, and again, I'd like to hear Mr. Tan's view on this, 
I, I, I really don't understand how they can expect the number, the proportion of disabled people uh, to go up given the, the state of uh, society in Singapore today. And so again, going back to this issue of inequality, now a lot of people think that the bulk of healthcare in Singapore is actually from the three M's, and that's not true. Okay, many save, many shield, many fund account for uh, less than 20% of the total healthcare budget in Singapore. Where does the bulk of healthcare come from? The answer is it comes from employer-based insurance. Okay, your company doctor, your panel doctor. I just had a friend yesterday, she called me up, she said her husband had chest pain. So I said, you better go get a chest x-ray and get an ECG. So she got a chest x-ray and they found a tumor in the, in the lung. I said, oh, that's terrible. So, uh, so she said, she went to the polyclinic, got a chest x-ray, found the tumor, was told, was given an appointment in SGH in August. And she said, that's way too far. I said, okay, uh, has he got insurance? He said, yes, uh, he works at the university, he's covered by the university insurance. So I called up my friend in Mount E, he said, okay, I'll see him on Monday. But he said, you know, if he wants a claim from the university, he has to go through the panel doctor See, or he has to go through the university health clinic, otherwise he cannot claim at all. See? So the bulk of, uh, in fact, this is the uh, this is data from, it was published the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, between 60 and 70 percent of the healthcare expenses in Singapore are paid for by employer uh, uh, health insurance or out of pocket. So uh, so I'm sure lots of you have, uh, have had these claims that you make from your company doctor. And this is unique in Singapore compared to the other East Asian countries. Okay, in Japan, uh, public insurance covers the bulk of, uh, of healthcare costs. In Hong Kong, the government subsidies cover the bulk. In Singapore, government subsidies covers about a third, but 50 to 60 percent actually comes from uh, your own company, company doctor, your your company's insurance policy, and out-of-pocket costs, which is way out of proportion to the other uh, developed Asian countries. So this actually goes back to this question um, uh, of inequality and, and in fact Margaret Chan, the former director of the WHO, she said direct out-of-pocket payments at the time of care are the single biggest barrier to universal coverage. While user fees have been promoted as a way to reduce the overuse of services, this is not what happens. User fees punish the poor. So user fees means like co-payment. That means you go to polyclinic you have, or even medical life. And if you like, you have to pay the first $3,000. You can only claim after $3,000. Okay. So, so the first $3,000 has to be paid by Medisave or by cash or by a company doctor or whatever. See. User fees punish the poor. They are inefficient. They encourage people to delay seeking care until the condition is far advanced. And when people do pay out of pocket care, financial ruin can be the result. So again, back to this idea, there has to be a better way. And uh, I think that the Singapore way in the 1970s and 80s was not bad. You know, when we still had uh, uh, the old left in the, in the PAP in the 1960s, they actually introduced the, the whole idea of universal, uh, you know, $1, $5 medical care. Uh, but we may not be able to go back to that. Now, there's, uh, some of you know my aunt, she's a big supporter of Function 8, and she passed away a few years ago. But she was Singaporean. She worked in Canada from 1972 to 1989. So she worked in Canada for 17 years. So what happened was when she came back to Singapore, she still received a pension. She received a pension from the university in Canada, which was topped up by the Canadian uh, federal pension because every month she had paid into it, like we pay into our CPF. Now, the value of that pension was it went up with inflation. So it's indexed to inflation in Canada. So every month she would get a check, she would get two checks actually, one from the university, one from the federal government. And I would pay it in to the bank, and that allowed her to stay at home, in her own home, it paid for her, even as she got more and more disabled, it paid for her medical needs, it paid for two domestic workers to look after her uh, every day. So she was looked after very well. And the most amazing thing is when she died, I wrote to both the university and the Canadian federal government, and the Can university said, okay, we'll stop the payments. The Canadian government kept sending payments for another two months. So I wrote to them again, and I said, hey, you know, I wrote to you earlier, and I told you she had passed away. He said, no, we recognize that families will have to pay funeral expenses and will have to do things after, after the, the first week died. And I said, what a country. <laughs> if it wasn't so poor, a lot of people would have migrated there. <laughs> so, so, but again, the argument is made that Canada has a lot of resources. Okay, it's a big land, it's got oil, it's got gas. So you look at a country without any natural resources. Okay, you look at Japan. Okay, Japan has just revamped its pension system. Previously, you had to work for 25 years before you were enabled to a pension benefit. As of 2016, you only needed to work for 10 years. 
and, and they have a gradated pension benefit. Again, it's something that you pay into. A lot of it comes from the company, but the federal government uh, or the imperial government will top up the benefit uh, when, when you don't have enough. Now, the, the biggest positive thing, I think, in addition to the medical fund changes that came after the 2011 GE, was the silver support scheme, which was introduced by my favorite PNP minister, I'm not telling you who. But uh, what it was is a de facto old age pension. And, and the thing about this that differs from cash deal life is you do not have to apply for silver support, it's automatic. See, once you reach the age, they look at your CPF balance. If your CPF balance is less than $70,000, you automatically, uh, uh, and then if you live in a, a one-room, three-room, five-room HDB flat, you're automatically entitled to the benefit of, of, of the silver support. And there are 152,000 people who benefited from silver support in 2017. The quantum is not a lot, okay? They give you like uh, uh, $750 if you live in a one-room flat for three months, so it's $250 a month. It's not a lot, but it, it is a start. Okay, this is the first time in like 20 or 30 years that Singapore has introduced some kind of an old age pension system. So I, a lot of us thought that it was a step in the right direction because this is funded out of taxes. This is not the money that the guy living in a one-room flat is paid in. This is funded out of the taxes on corporations, on, on everybody else, you see. But unfortunately, that has not happened. Uh, so what are the alternatives? The other alternatives is community organization. And this is an organization called Unlock, which is based in San Francisco's Chinatown. And it was started by a group of individuals there. And uh, the person who drove it along was a Swiss uh, social worker. Her name is Marie Anspach. And she actually lived in a boat off to us for, for many years uh, after she retired from San Francisco. And what happened was there were these old folk in San Francisco, and they were put in a nursing home, and they hated it. Number one, nobody could speak Cantonese. Number two, they hated the food there. So they decided to, they wanted to, they said, and they had their own homes, you see, that they were comfortable with, they were in their neighbors, they were in Chinatown. So some people got together and they decided, okay, it's too expensive to have a nurse go to every single one of these people's homes. So let's have a nurse shared among the four or five people, so that, you know, the nurse goes to the person's home A, helps the person with the bathing, the cleaning, the feeding, and then goes upstairs to the next person, and it has to function as a cooperative. See, so the local businesses get involved because it's their relatives, it's their grandparents. Sure, some of them have moved to New York, but you know, New York, uh, San Francisco's Chinatown is the oldest uh, Chinese community in, uh, in California. So the community came together and, and it became very successful. And then they applied for federal government, state government funding, and they managed to keep it going. And it's become a model all over the world. In fact, they have been invited to Singapore to talk to us, but it's, it's again, not so easy to, uh, to fly. And again, of course, you know, uh, seeing as uh, where I come from, the uh, SDP health plan uh, it is something that we put out several years ago. And basically, it involves the idea of a larger government contribution, which already has been done. Uh, public insurance system, the beginnings of that were put in with MediShield Life. Regulation of insurance payouts. Now, this has not happened. Okay, what you may have heard is that, uh, you know, some of you have bought these uh, um, uh, shield plans where you where you get a uh, rider, where you don't have to pay the first dollar. So you, those plans are still in existence, but as of next year, you will not be able to buy those plans anymore. You will have to do a co-payment. But I think that's a really regressive step, because if you do a co-payment, you're not going to get your colonoscopy. You see? You're going to end up waiting until you get colon cancer, and then you need surgery, and you need chemotherapy, whereas if you got colon, colonoscopy, you could have treated it when it was pre-cancerous or something like that. So uh, the regulation has not occurred. Co-payment with CAP for outpatient and inpatient care. And responsive long-term care at the point of need. So this is what we talked about, the void deck uh, healthcare system. And, and again, there were the beginnings of that, but it hasn't really taken off. And there's still a wall. You go to your GP, you try and get subsidies, you, you, it's very, very hard. You have to get the, the chronic disease management program. There's a lot of paperwork. Most of the GPs hate doing it because it all has to be done online. In fact, when I talk to uh, JC students who are applying for medical school, they always say, "Can I? How come I can't get to do attachments at the university hospital or some fancy hospital?" I said, "No, you just go to your block. You go to the GP. The GP probably is frustrated with trying to get subsidies for his patients. You tell him I'm an 18 year old. I know how to use a computer. I can fix it for you. He will definitely love you and take you in." <laughs> so, so a lot of them have done that okay? <laughs> because it, it's really hard to to manipulate the system uh, or use the system rather. Um, and, and again, I think it's a philosophical issue. See, 
it's whether you view healthcare as a human right, being you know having a decent uh, uh, kind of living. If you're disabled, should you be allowed to you know live a, a a life where you can interact as much as you can with your family, with people around you, and and, uh, and I think basically very very few people choose to be sick or ill. So the government always tries to worry about people are scamming the system. You know, and if 1% of people are scamming the system, go after that 1%, don't make the other 99% suffer. You know? and, and that's always been uh, my philosophy. Uh, one of the greatest uh, experts in, in uh, uh, health economics is Bill Xiao from Harvard School of Economics. And he said, before you can set up a healthcare system for any country, you have to know the country's basic ethical values. The first question is, do people in your country have a right to healthcare? If the people believe medical care is a basic right, you design a system that means anybody who is sick can see a doctor. If society contains, considers medical care to be an economic commodity, then you set up a system that distributes health care based on the ability to pay. And then the poor pretty much are left out. Okay, so he's addressing the US healthcare system, but unfortunately, as I tell people, Singapore seems intent on repeating all the mistakes of US healthcare over the last 20 years. So hopefully, again, we can do something about it. So that was my last slide, and I'd like to get the lights back on again.